Jun Fukumachi, the prog frog man, had quite the eclectic career, starting playing piano from a young age and was very talented. He was already composing while still at university, which, you know, is not bad. <laughs> then went on to release countless LPs and projects for his whole life. But only recently hit it international. If you look at his first LPs, they were a rocking time. Thick basses, burgeoning horns, blistering guitar solos, then an organ slides in. The early output doesn't fit into his later style, this isn't an outer space dark synth jazz fusion prog show performed by Liberace. It's a warm rocking time with the occasional ballad and a bit of jazz thrown in for the good measure. And it moved into sort of a rock opera area by the end of Hello. Then by 75 we get into the lounge esque jazz fusion stage. The synthetic is introduced, which would become a staple of his palette later on. Then when La Fille Chavanne de Olon came out, he started to show small signs of that foreboding future tone, as Jean brought international talents to record, many from New York, who he'd play with live. Fukumachi's best known in Japan, though, for a synth instrumental recreation of the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts of the Band album. And because of the success of that one, he became sort of a covers man for the rest of his career. By the late 70s, synths were his go-to, if it be in fusion jams from his 78 work or accompanied by his jazz contemporaries. The next year, The Sinking Heike, is somewhere where you get to see his burgeoning style begin. He became a one-man band with his synthesizers as they are his orchestra. And then, of course, by 1980, Quark is released. And eight months ago, that was re-uploaded onto YouTube, and it skyrocketed the scene multi-instrumentalist onto the world stage of the internet, garnering him similar dedication from his other LPs as it went. Now, why Quark? Well, outside of the algorithm's mystery ways, there's that frog energy. This silly little cover with a beanie baby looking thing had some momentum behind it as people made millions of dumb frog puns as people were listening and relaxing to the beats. They're putting chemicals in the water and turning the frickin' frogs prong! And it made it have a respectable and still growing view count. Now it seems that YouTube comments and clicks have opened up the gates for classic Japanese music, more so than the whole country of Japan. But jokes aside, I'd like to say its adventurous prog synth soundscapes were probably the reason it's gotten so popular. I mean, people like it. It really pushes the limits of those genres. Jun is on his own, with his own tools and four songs, each about 10 minutes long. Starting with the first track, Quark, which is maximum space sound, with cycling keyboards of foreboding chants, it's a valiant venture with an ever-evolving landscape of the record here. We cut back the piano, stripping away the layers before elevating all the way back, just to get that core melody in its pure beauty. It's a frog armada in space that have to save their home from an intergalactic space demon. Jazz fusion bleeds into the backdrop of its sci-fi setting. It can't escape the past, huh? And it has a laid-back rhythm to it. Slowly getting more contemplated towards the end before it begins to repeat its verbose patterns. <laughs> The second track, Perpetual, we got some bleep bloopers that cycle over this horror inducing score. Larger than life electronics swallow this tension, permeate a feeling of fear, and then transform into bemusement. A jammy solo erupts, the cycling synth tones are relentless, smashing pianos bring life to a chilled world. It's layers which all spiral from, for a one man show of intensity, explosiveness. His relentless interdimensional journey through the unknown. His filmic orchestra influences shine through here. Quark is an album that gives Fukumachi space to experiment as wide as possible, showing the brunt of all what came before. It's easy to be spellbind by its aura.
delusion is sort of a prog explosion. You know, we go from intimate ballad with the contrast between its piano and electric instrumentation, a couple horn tones on there, which move into its jazzy side halfway through. It has emotional highs and lows, reassuring you like you're coming in from the cold after a very long night. Robotic voices serenade the squeaky guitar noises, and it sings a passionate tune, even if it's not using a real voice. It's the longest, most Baroque, going from the smallest to the largest crescendos you can see on this side of the space system. And the final track becomes the bleakest, foreboding situation. It's psycho in space. It's nothing more than the sort of avant-garde tension-inducing anxiety biter with its pulsing heartbeat pounding a guttural electronic buzz before it burns itself out in a sort of simmering sensation. And that's not the only story behind Fukumachi. In 1982, a fashion designer, Mitsuhiro, Matsuda needed music for his fashion shows in New York, and who else did he turn to but Fukumachi? And who happened to be there but Andy Warhol, who found his music alluring. He wanted a tape. Lucky his manager was willing to give it to him, and this led to more work. His melting pot of musical trends seemed to take hold in the fashion realm. It sort of took off, you know, it sort of bring that curtain of dread around these appearances. It was a mesmerizing experience, fitting the fashion landscape of Japan at the time. Moody, subtle qualities pulled from jazz, prog, funk, classical, ambient, and pop, they said. Eric Saatchi helped uh, inspire one of his more iconic pieces. 1986's Nicole, Spring and Summer. Fukumachi recorded Nicole alone in the studio over the course of three days, where he worked on it from early evening to midnight. The album you could call a gone in its own legacy, being one of the few re-releases you can get now around the West and these parts. It's a hidden treasure for sure. Shoutouts to W2FWW Records for basically re-releasing it. They also did Ryo Fukui's back catalogue too. So you know they got style. In 89, he was appointed a professor of music at Sensoku Gakuen University and established Japan's first synthesizer department. Of course, an expert at this point, but kept making music until the 2010s. And he made a lot of it. According to Jun Fukumachi's widow, throughout all his music that he created, he always had an awareness of producing something that is beautiful. She says he approached it with the same stance. Fukumachi created his art through a deep philosophical lens. He saw music as a gift from the heavens and held magical powers. You couldn't study it, he thought it just was. He never spoke about it after he finished it. When it was completed, it was not something that he went back to. He always focused on making new music. And I can relate to that. I rarely think back to things I've created. See, when it's done, there's a lot of baggage that comes with it, and it sort of becomes the people's. You have to focus on the next thing to keep your creative juices going. He once said there's only good and bad music. What he means by this is that good music is pure. When he says bad music, he's talking about music that is deliberately produced for commercial purposes. It's a weird perspective for a man who'd made so many cover albums, including many anime series, from Space Yamato to Urusei Yatsura, Fukumachi seemed a fascinating man with a huge collection of great and kooky albums, and I'm glad a couple of channels in particular are leading the charge of uploading Fukumachi's back catalogue, otherwise most of it would have been lost in limbo in some bargain bin. Basically forever. My respect goes out to them, and I doubt I would have found them without those videos. I just hope he gets enough momentum to get some official re-releases in my area. That would be neat. Hey, if you've got a, like a Japanese artist you'd like me to look at, leave a comment in the uh, little description there. And the one with the most upvotes will be put on the list. Or you can request one on my Patreon. I've got to thank my Patreons for helping me out so much, including Daniel Strait. Also, big thank you to Joven and that Puerto Rican guy. And yeah, fun fact. Jun Fukumachi actually did the horns on some of the Cassiopeia early albums. He really got around. And also, if we're talking about Song of the Day, it has to be, it has to be, bringing new life from the Nicole collection. Check it out. Anyway, 
I'll catch you next time.